This is Billy from AdultCello.com and today I'm sharing five things I wish I had known before starting the cello as an adult. So as I've mentioned before, I started my cello journey at age 25 as a complete beginner. I couldn't read music, I didn't know what a half note was or what it meant when I heard so and so's cello sonata in G minor. If you're in the same shoes as I was, then I guarantee that taking these five points to heart will be a tremendous boost to your learning curve and the faster we can get past the choppy shoreline of beginner playing and into the deeper waters of musicianship, the more rewarding and enjoyable you're gonna find the experience. Before we get going, please consider subscribing and hitting that like button below. All right, number one, ear training, or more specifically, developing excellent relative pitch, because if you can hear it, you can play it. To be clear, I'm not talking about perfect pitch. Relative pitch is the ability to hear and recognize musical intervals. So for example, can you hear the difference between these two intervals? Being able to hear and recognize intervals will help you with things like intonation and playing in tune and also if you want to be able to play things by ear. It will also help you develop your inner ear, which will give you the ability to hear a pitch in your head before playing it on the instrument. In this way, your brain can lead your finger to the pitch you already hear clearly, instead of using muscle memory to find a note and then using your ear afterwards to check whether you hit the note accurately or not. This is a huge difference. So here's my advice. Don't do all of your ear training on your instrument while you practice. There's already so much going on with the bow hand, the bow hold, pulling the straight bow, left hand shape, coordinating the two hands, your general posture. To get ahead of the game, practice interval ear training off the cello. I've got a link to my favorite ear training tool in the description below. All right, number two, get obsessed with your bow arm. Yes, your bow arm. It's really easy to fixate on the left hand. We all want to play in tune and the rapid fingerings can seem so complicated compared to the bow arm. But once you have your basic left hand shape developed and you're somewhat comfortable with the fingerboard, I found awkward bow use is more often the culprit for any problems that arise. Things like feeling uncoordinated, not being satisfied with your sound, are sure signs that you may want to devote more attention to your bow arm. I'd encourage you to experiment with separating the hands. In your practice today, pick a passage that you're having trouble with and isolate the bow by taking your left hand out of the equation. So yes, you'll be playing with open strings only and this will help you to work out what you need to be doing with the bow without the distraction of the left hand. I found that if I can play a passage comfortably with the right hand only, then inevitably I won't have much of a problem adding the left hand. However, that's hardly ever the case the other way around. So if we think about something like the 80-20 principle as it relates to cello, for myself and for my students, I have seen over and over again, the biggest gains come from really focusing on the bow arm. So give at least as much attention to your bow arm as you do to your left hand. Point number three, one beautiful note is worth a thousand plain ones. Okay, so it can be easy to get into a mindset where you equate progress with being able to play pieces of harder and harder difficulty. I definitely went through a period like that. I was so determined to progress that I would push my teacher to assign me more difficult and longer pieces. The more pieces I'd learned, the better I was getting, or so I thought. I was able to get through and play them, but I usually didn't feel great about it afterwards. I came to realize that surviving through a piece and really playing a piece are two very different things. So it is important to tackle new repertoire and work on developing technique. But at the same time, don't lose sight of why you started playing cello, to be able to express yourself artistically and create beautiful, rich sounds. All right, number four, the power of slow practice. I remember when I was first introduced to the idea of practicing passages way under tempo, I felt A, like I was being punished, and B, like there was no way that learning to play something at such a glacial rate would ever actually help me when I eventually tried the passage at full speed. How you practice is more important than how much you practice. So for the same person with the same amount of practice hours invested, it can mean the difference between plodding along with moderate progress and improving dramatically by leaps and bounds. My first breakthrough in developing more efficient practice habits was learning how to practice slowly. It is an art form in itself and initially it requires a lot of patience. And then I gave it a real try, forcing myself to do entire practice sessions of what felt like insanely slow practice. And that's when I became a convert. 
previously difficult passages suddenly felt smooth as butter to execute and eerily like I was on autopilot. Sometimes after really good slow practice, my hands would then be able to play at full speed as if some advanced later version of myself was visiting from the future and demonstrating through my body. Slow practice gives you the time to investigate the intricacies of whatever you're working on. You can examine and control the choreography of your two hands and the ways in which subtleties in the timing between the two can create trademarks of advanced playing such as clean legato lines and hidden shifts. And finally, number five, shop around. A lot of people simply find a teacher and get going without trying out a few candidates first. For a motivated beginner who wants to put in consistent work, the right teacher is equivalent to miracle Grow. You will learn at a faster rate and build a solid technical foundation so that you don't end up having to rebuild your technique or fix bad habits down the road. Okay, so what does the right teacher look like? As you can imagine, I think different people will benefit from different teaching styles and personalities, but here are two guidelines. I would first make sure that your teacher plays the cello well. You may not be a string connoisseur yet, but you can still look for obvious red flags. Do they seem very physically tense when demonstrating, or do the demonstrations sound clumsy or unmusical to you? Since so much of your initial lessons will likely involve teacher demonstrations, I think it's ideal if you really like the way your teacher sounds as a player. So now a warning. I'm not saying that a better player is invariably going to be a better teacher. Just as in sports, the best performers don't always make the best coaches. The second thing to look for in a teacher is a good connection personality-wise. Just as with colleagues at work, you want to find someone who really knows what they're doing and who's also a pleasure to work with. Bottom line, my advice would be to do a trial lesson or two with a few different teachers that seem like possible candidates. Most likely one of them will pull ahead of the pack and be a clear winner. So there are my top five things I wish I knew starting the cello as an adult. At the end of the day, the most important thing is to get started, so I wouldn't obsess over getting off to the perfect start. But if I had known these five points ahead of time, I would have benefited enormously from them. If you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing to my channel, and thanks so much for watching.